My name is David Pesikoff. I am the class of 1990. Uh, I've never done one of these before, and so we'll all find out how it works. Um, I'm going to try to give you what I teach here, and I'm sitting here at Williams College. I, I can see uh, Greylock Quad on my left, and it's a not great day here. It's real foggy and 45 degrees, but it's a it's more fun than I can imagine having. I teach 22 hours of class uh, this January, and I'm going to try and explain to you what I do in 40 minutes. And we're just going to go with that kind of elision. Uh, and this is actually what I wear to class every day. I wear some form of Williams gear and a t-shirt. And it's really a lovely place where people, we talk about lots of ideas and it doesn't really matter what you look like, which is good for me. Um, you can drop your questions into the Q&A box at any time. We'll get to them kind of at the end. You can do them anonymously. You can put your name on them. I, it's all good by me. Um, so what do I teach? This is a good question. I teach investing. My remit is to teach basic investing. And I am here to give kids who don't have a good grounding in finance or any grounding in finance the tools to A, think about doing more and B, to get an interview, right? So that you could go to an interview and have a sentient conversation with an interviewer and have something interesting to say and just enough for them to be interested in saying, I'd like to see more of, of this young woman in my firm this summer. A little bit about me, uh, I am class of 90 and I am also P20 which is quite lovely for me. And my mail comes always 90 P20. So that's how I think of myself. Um, I majored in mathematics here at Williams. My I know most of the math department because they're still here. I worked for Bain and I worked for the Mac group after I graduated from Williams. And then I went to the Stanford Business School uh, and I spent 15 years in equity research at a very large privately owned firm in Texas called Fire Seraphim and Company. And in 2008, I decided to do something different. And two very old friends of mine and I went and founded Triangle Peak Partners. We are a, a small venture capital firm and I've done that now for 16 years. So it's the longest place I've ever worked. And I, uh, I'm a founder and, and we've had a really great time. Um, this is the fourth year of this course that I'm teaching. I have had between 36 and 24 students. I have 24 right now which feels like the right number. Um, it's a very popular class. This year I had over 61 students apply. And so I'm trying to figure out how to double the class without doubling my workload. And that's all to say, if any one of you is thinking of coming up here for a month and you would like to, to talk about teaching something like this, that would be great because I would love a clone of me or I got to figure out some way to do this because that's just a lot of students who want this. And it really is the only... This is the only um, thing like it. There are things similar-ish, but this is the only thing that does what we do. And I teach through the lens of financial fraud. So what does that mean? Um, we learn a lot about how to think about companies by looking at all the ways you could do it wrong. And we try to home in on what's right by kind of taking off large sections of where I want to think about that smells funny. And also it's just good fun. Um, we are investing in public stock, right? My remit is not venture capital and it is not private equity. We are talking about the basic grounding and how to invest in a public stock. And that's me. I'm a DLP3 at williams.edu or at Gmail. If you end up having questions or you're curious about either the class or how winter study works or how do you get to apply to, to teach a winter study or what how does this work at Williams now? I was here 35 years ago and it's not the same, but it, it it's the same in all things that really matter. So the first thing we talk about is what is a company, right? Companies are entities designed for a purpose and it's an entity because it doesn't have to go for profit, right? But it's, it's a thing that a bunch of people get together to do because they want to produce something, a good, a service, uh, whatever it is, right? And we want to think about how do they talk to us? How does a company tell us what they do? Well, the nice thing, the first thing they do is that they tell us in prose, in, in our own language, right? So we read annual reports and we read what the company says about itself. And that's the first place we start. And that is the most powerful thing that we start. 
And the next thing we do is we talk about financial statements. And in the same way that English has a language, right? It's, um, you have to learn how to read English. Financial statements have their own language. They have their own syntax, they have grammar. You, you have to learn how to read it. And I, uh, I'm learning German at the moment. And one of the things I, I, I know about German is uh, the verbs at the end. So you wouldn't say, I want to go to the store. You would say, I want the store to go to. And your brain has to kind of recalibrate and hold things in different places if you're an English reader, to understand that sentence. Financials are the same way. They talk to us at their own cadence. And we talk about how are we going to translate that financial statement back into English? How do we analyze a business? So the first week we spend looking at, I teach them some basic analyses. We use a five forces analysis, which is a very old kind of way of thinking about a business. We then look at financial statements. We look at income statements, balance sheets, and cash flow statements, because those are the big three. And we always read the footnotes. The footnotes are where the action is. Everybody will produce income statements. What really matters is definitions. What is revenue? So we talk about the issue of, for example, revenue at a retailer has to include a percent of what you think returns are going to be. What does it mean to be a completed sale? Very simple words can be very complex. And all of that is contained in the footnotes. So I, the class culminates in the, in the students in groups of four picking a stock. And they pitch a stock and they say, and I tell them, pick something you can understand and pick an annual report less than 100 pages. And they want to know why less than 100 pages. And my answer is because you're, you're going to read it. You're going to have to read all the footnotes and that's where the action is. So we talk about how does a business work? How does it represent itself in prose? How does it represent itself in financial statements? And what is the linkage? And that linkage is in the footnotes. How do I define the English so that when I'm reading the number, I understand what the number actually means in English? So we have a lot of fun. And the first thing I do is I say, well, great, let's take this this show and let's analyze Williams College. So we do. How do we think about Williams College? So we think about suppliers. Who supplies what to Williams College? It turns out the whole system here is the faculty and the staff. And we know that that is the biggest, that is the biggest thing. There's some supplies, there's some utilities, but the, the faculty has a lot of power over the college in the sense that this is, they end up with tenure, right? So they, they have this very, it's not quite a union, but it's kind of a union. It's kind of a union of one times 300. We talk about the buyers. Who are the buyers? Well, the, the students are good at saying, well, my, the students are the buyers. That's true. Um, parents are buyers. College counselors are buyers. The college does uh, research and that research is government funded. The government is a buyer of the college. The alumni are buyers of the college, right? Everybody that the college has to satisfy in some way, we think of as buying the good or service that the college is delivering. We talk about uh, substitutes. How do we think about what my other choices are? There are tons of other colleges. And in the last 25 years, we have online education. So things that we used to be almost proprietary that would have been provided at college are now things that the college may not be optimally designed to produce. So for example, language. Can we learn languages better online than we can at college? What's our highest and best use? How is that changing over time? We talk about new entrants. Uh, who does Williams compete with that might show up? It's an arms race. There's up, there are up and coming colleges. We also talked about online education. And the most important thing in any business is to figure out what is the nature of rivalry? How do businesses compete against each other? And here, Williams competes for faculty. So they're competing to get the people that they want. And that has really weird implications here. We're a small town. And one of the issues in being a small town is we don't have a lot of opportunities for the trailing spouse. There are many, many partners and couples who work for the college. 
both faculty, both staff, one staff, one faculty, the college thinks a lot about how am I going to bring this person here and this person's family? Uh, interestingly, Amherst has a similar problem, but Amherst has a five college consortium. So it turns out that every time Amherst hires someone, the spouse um, has a resume or wants to do a certain job that is shared among all the five colleges. So Amherst gets something and so does Smith and Holyoke and UMass and Hampshire as long as it survives. And so that's a different ecosystem. We don't have that. And so for us, the way that we have to, uh, what we offer is a product of where we are and the faculty we're competing to get, which is the same faculty Amherst is competing to get. We compete with each other on the quality of facilities. We compete with each other very much on aid, uh, the alumni network, the depth, the breadth, course offerings. I mean, and at the level that Williams is, it is competing on student teacher ratio, job placement and aid, right? These are the kinds of, the, we, we learn, these are the big ones. And so we talk about where should Williams be thinking about? How long do certain decisions last? You hire a faculty member, you will have that person, we hope, for 30 years. How do we think about that with buildings? Buildings last on average 30 years. The alumni network, 200 years, right? These are very long live notions of internal rivalry, which is not the case in every industry. So we actually, it's a fascinating thing to talk to, to the students with. One of the other things we talk about is uh, inflation. And I tell them they all have the same inflation rate because different consumers have different inflation rates. And they figure out that their own personal inflation rate is whatever Maud says tuition is going up this year, right? Because that's their inflation. And so we, we talk about how tethered they are to the decision that they've made at Williams. And they want to think through all of these kinds of choices they have so that they make, they understand the long live nature of, you know, coming here, which as an alum who's still teaching here 35 years later, I'm, I'm incredibly blessed with the long live nature of it. Um, and then we look at Williams College, we look at the books. So I'm gonna see if I can get my computer to share something with me. These are the books of the college. And the kids, I mean, they, the students understand that there are books of the college, but they don't, they've never really thought about it. They've never really thought that this is a business. So we stare at this. We start with uh, a balance sheet. A balance sheet is a statement of what I have at any particular time. And in order to make sense of a balance sheet, I need two of them. So here we have the one for 22 and 23. And I can kind of compare what what are the big things that Williams has on, a on its balance sheet? And what I'm trying to do is read the balance sheet and translate it back to English. I wanna know in the end, because we speak to each other in English, I wanna know what does this tell me? What am I learning? How should I think about it? And more than anything, I, I teach them, go for the big things, figure out where to spend your time. We talk about the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, right? Which is, 80% uh, of my profits come from 20% of my customers. 80% of the value of anything is usually 20% of the time. Spend 20% of your time to find the big things in here and home in on what matters. So, you know, this is kind of funny. We're looking at assets and, you know, the big deal here is, well, it's the endowment. I mean, the entire balance sheet is $4.8 billion, but the endowment is three and a half of that. Oh, and by the way, land and buildings and investments in the physical plant by the time you and, and we're going to x out the clark because we'll see why it turns out the whole balance sheet is physical assets and liquid assets in the endowment the rest of it is sort of immaterial right it just isn't going to move the needle we go down and look at liabilities we basically only have one that matters you can see that the Clark Art Institute is a net. So we have an asset and a liability that match each other. It's a very strange entry. And we talk about why that's on the balance sheet. We are doing something for the Clark. We manage their endowment for them, but it's not our money. And so we have an asset and a liability and they cancel. The big deal that Williams has is bonds, right? We, we've got this 
$372 million bond outstanding. Other than that, we, we basically have no liabilities. So that's a really interesting thing, right? Is the college, should it be more levered? We talk about like, well, there is no leverage on this business. Should we have leverage? It's, it's not for profit. It's it's a college. It's a, you know, it's a complicated question. Uh, and then we talk about uh, the income statement. Okay, so the income statement is a record of what I did over a certain period of time. So this income statement is going to tell me what I did over the year. Great. And it's going to tell me, uh, and I won't get into the sort of with and without donor restriction. It's a, it's a somewhat complicated way to read a balance sheet. But it, it's going to tell me what we did uh, over the year. Great. Well, what do we do over the year? Well, it turns out that the college has $300 million of operating revenue. Where did we get the revenue? About 100 million of it came from the, from student fees. 150 million of it, actually 160 million of it, came from these two lines that are that say investment gains appropriated and net assets released from restriction. Net assets released from restriction is code for the endowment gave money, right? So that's really interesting. Uh, only a third of our revenue comes from students. Almost 60%, 55% of our money comes from the endowment. And we've got another seven, eight, 10% that's a little bit of gifts and grants, a little bit of special purpose, a little bit of other, but the real money is in the endowment and the student fees. Okay, we understand something about how the firm is, is funded. We talk about what are we spending on? Well, we have a $300 million operating budget. Sales and wages and employee benefits are 160 of that. Well, okay, now I know that 55% of my expenses come from humans, which is what I thought when I did my analysis of what I thought the business was. It's all high priced labor. So the books are talking to me in the same way that that the language of the college, when it talks to me about what it is, these are matching. And I'm translating back and forth from English to numbers and numbers to English. Um, I have a very large depreciation expense, which makes sense to me because I just read that I have a $700 million plant. In fact, you're gonna learn something about that plant. That plant is actually about a billion one. We, we said earlier, an average building is 30 years. 30 into a billion one is like $37 million. Turns out depreciation is 39 million. This is all footing, right? I, I am looking for things that confirm what I think I understand. It's all making sense to me, right? And these are tiny little checks that we do as we walk through all of these numbers. And then we have some, these are all rounding errors, adjustments for changes in, and, and we walk through them, but we don't really spend, we, I'm not, here to make them learn every line. Um, so this is our, oh, and this is last year. Okay, so this is this is sort of, I'm flipping through. Okay, we have cash flow statements. So the cash flow statement's interesting. What did I use to operate the business? And the real big number that shows up is realized change in unrealized gains and losses on investments, right? realized, realized and change in unrealized gains, right? So effectively my cash flow op operating is all about I'm losing my I'm losing a ton of money. And how do I, am I going to make that money? I'm going to make that money from my investments. So the college is telling me what I knew. If the student fees are only 33% and I'm running a $300 million enterprise, I'm losing a ton of money. Where does that money come from? It comes from the endowment. Where does that come in a cash flow statement? A cash flow statement is a very complicated thing. It's divided into sections. We go through the sections of operating, investing, and financing. And this is the kid, the students ask, why is this an investment cash flow and not a financing cash flow? And we go through that, but it turns out the, the, the gap rule is if you sell securities to fund your business, well, that's an investing cash flow. So the college lost 120 million in operating. It made up 140 million of that by selling securities. Uh, and then there's a little bit of extra, and then it and sold more than it needed. So it increased in cash. This makes sense to us, right? We read these numbers and we can tell the story. 
So the narrative flows from what the college tells us and it flows from the books. And we want these things to match. And wherever they don't match, we have questions, right? These are, there's something about this that we want to know more. And all of that, all of the fun stuff happens in the footnotes. And I'm going to go through not all of the footnotes because they're not all that interesting, but I am gonna go through a couple of the footnotes. So this is the footnote that tells me where we allocated that money from the endowment. So it says that student charges, the face charge was 133 million, or 163 million if we include, include the tuition room and board, but that students only delivered directly 98 million of that. So of that 100 and something million that the endowment gives the college, 65 million of it kind of came as a transfer from the endowment to students who then give it to the college. That's interesting because it also says, well, there was another you know, $80 million, almost a, or a $95 million the endowment delivered to the college. Where'd that go? That was spread among all of us. In other words, the college is only is spending 300 million or in fact, 260 in cash if we take out depreciation. And so it's only collecting 163 in posted fees. It's kind of giving everybody a discount. So when the college talks to the alumni about the great deal that all the kids get and what, what 200 years of generosity has delivered, this is telling us how it's delivering it. It's telling us where it gets allocated, telling us who gets it, who gets it specifically, and who gets it generally. It's all right here. And this is this is, I mean, the kids can begin to really understand about when the college says, well, you're all getting a break, they're all getting a break. We talk about the valuation of assets. You think, well, the college has all these liquid assets. The assets are not all as liquid as you might think. So we read about how it is that we are gonna calculate the value of assets when they're not exactly liquid. We talk a little bit about that. The note that I thought was very interesting, which I will, scroll through and find, ah, this is fascinating. So one of the things we talk about is uh, book value and the accounting, and it's supposed to represent reality. But there are a bunch of rules in accounting that distort that. And one of them is land and buildings and physical assets that are rare. You are not allowed to write up those assets at any time. You may sell them and realize again, but you can't write them up. So here we have that, the college is telling us in the footnote, which is where all the money is, depreciation is calculated over a straight line basis. We estimate buildings 40 to 60 years, land and improvements 20 years, equipment three. Okay, this is great, fine. The college's art and rare books collections are recorded at cost or appraised value at the date of acquisition. They are not depreciated and it does not capitalize anything in the rare books or the library. So when I ask the kids, you know, I'll say to the students, how much do you think the rare books collections are worth? They're on the books of the college. I think it's something like $13 million. I mean, it's, it's some number. Well, we have printings of the Declaration of Independence. We have original manuscripts from the 16th century uh, astronomic treatises and texts from the 16th century. We have fragments from the original calculus books printed. I mean, Newton, right? We have an astounding array of stuff. I guarantee you it's worth more than 11 million. In fact, the Declaration of Independence alone is worth more than what it's on the books for. This is our first foray into the idea that real value and accounting value are unlikely to be true. And they're unlikely to, to, to dovetail. They are, one of them is, you know, we want to know what it's really worth. The books are probably not going to tell us what the whole thing is worth. They're good at some things. They're not good at other things. And the students ask, well, why, why shouldn't I revalue that every year? Why shouldn't I, why doesn't the book reflect that? It, we have decided as a society to, that lends itself to certain other problems, right? And the real question here is what problems do we want to have? Because it's not about getting rid of all the problems. It's about recognizing which problems I want to deal with and which problems I don't. And in this case, we've chosen that we don't want to deal with the vagaries of people 
who have the incentive to raise the value and lower the value. But it is the case that there is somebody on this campus who knows what those things are worth. And uh, why does somebody know what those things are worth? Because they are insured. And so we have to have a value for them. The controller's office knows exactly what the rare books are worth because we carry insurance on them. Is that publicly disclosed? It's not publicly disclosed. And that's another interesting thing for them is the rules around what can they know? What do they want to know that's important that they, they really want to know, but they can't know? And does it matter enough to change their opinion? So we, we have this fun where we look at the college. I have fun. I think it's great. Uh, and then we discuss, how am I going to value this thing? Right now, I know what it is. I understand the books. I get the story. And we really only have two methods. We have a comparable and we have an absolute. So a comparable is to compare the firm's internal performance and its price to those of its competitors and itself, right? So I'm trying to understand how, is this worth less or more than something that looks like this? How do I think about that? There's a problem with that. It's a great measure of relative value, but it's a really marginal measure of absolute value, right? Because we could both be too high. We could both be too low. But at least in that case, we talk about buying low and selling high. So I, I can arbitrage that difference. My other answer is to do a discounted cash flow. And we talk about projecting the cash flows, discounting them back, a dollar today, a dollar tomorrow. The central idea is if inflation is 5% and I have a dollar today, I need a dollar five in a year to preserve my purchasing power. Well, the discount rate for an investment is what is what could I get from investing in all things? Maybe it's 8%. So everything I touch has to have a hurdle of at least 8% because otherwise I, I wouldn't pick that thing. We talk about growth rates, we talk about models, and then we talk about all the shortcomings. DCFs are absolutely perfect in theory. They're, they're flawless. The problem is your assumptions are usually um, for lack of a better word, crap. You know, we, we don't know what the growth rate is in nine years. It's kind of hard to figure out what the discount rate might be. It's a precise measure of value, but its inputs are incredibly hard to get right. And so we have one that's easy, but has, a, has this absolute problem. And we have one that's hard, but it gets the absolute right. It doesn't tell us, you know, so we struggle between the two and we titrate between those. And we talk about reverse engineering. Maybe I don't have to do a DCF. Maybe what I should do is figure out what the market's telling me. And if I believe that, what are all the assumptions I'd have to buy to believe that this price is a fair one? And I only need then to decide, well, that's too little or that's too much. I don't have to make quite the decision that I'm being, that, that I was having to make before. Um, why fraud? Why do we teach fraud? Okay, so first of all, fraud to me is like magic. I, I love it. I think it is utterly hilarious. I, you cannot believe that these stories are real, right? They're, they're stranger than fiction. You can't write this stuff. So what do we read? Um, oh, and fraud teaches skepticism. I, I don't want them to be cynical. I want them to learn how to ask questions. I want them to learn how to think through and say, I, I don't understand that. And sometimes if it can it be understood, it may be that it's not me that can't understand it. It may be that it cannot be understood, which might be incompetence, might be fraud. So what frauds did we read? Because I get this question all the time. The first thing we read is Bad Blood, which is the story of Theranos. They read that uh, over winter break. And it is the story of a woman who had an idea, but never actually turned it into anything and then lied about it and raised a billion dollars. And it's a beautiful story. If you haven't read it, it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, written by a Wall Street Journal reporter. And so these stories are very accessible, right? They're, they're, we're not reading the technical nature of fraud. The next book we read is The Smartest Guys in the Room, which is Enron, written by uh, Bethany McLean, class of 92. And it's a wonderful book. And we read it in the second week because we do our accounting in the second week. And this book is about a great business that wasn't big enough for the people running it. And they wanted to do more. 
the problem was the more was just terrible. And in order to make the more look like the original business, they resorted to all kinds of accounting fraud. And so because we're doing accounting in the second week of the class, this is the book we read so that we can begin to look at real world examples of how to talk about accounting and turned accounting back and forth into English and numbers. Again, we're trying to get this facility of translation going. And so this book's really helpful for that. And the third book we read is called Pyramid of Lies, which is about the Greensill Capital Company, uh, which failed. And one of the things that, that the students appreciate is that one of the things that makes the firm fail is COVID. So the thing that upends their lives upends this thing and the most amazing thing to me about the pyramid of lies it's not that big a fraud i mean i don't know it's nine billion or something um it's the precipitating fraud that starts a chain of events that takes down credit suisse so credit suisse is you know 150 years old and it's now no more and this is one of the companies that's instrumental in taking down one of the world's oldest and largest banks and so we talk about this is an example, by the way, of a business where they had a real business. The problem was the business just wasn't very good. And in order to get the returns they wanted, they just kept throwing Hail Marys. And eventually the whole thing goes under. But they're wonderful stories about so many things. But one of the things that I teach the students always is the numbers are the product of human endeavor. Right? So many times in finance, you get lost in the numbers. And what I'm teaching is these companies are run by people. Let's understand what motivates people. Majoring in economics is, is I'll tell you the story at the end, sorry. Majoring in economics is interesting if you like the question economics asks, but it's not business, right? It's not asking you a business question. It's only asking you an interesting theoretical question, which is fantastic. But it isn't business. And I. this is one of the things we talk about is how many skill sets need to be brought to bear in any enterprise. Investing is one of them. Um, frauds have things in common that we look for, right? Poor governance, poor employee incentives, highly complex financials, secrecy, imperiousness. I mean, these are all kind of tells where you may not know there's a fraud, but you don't have to play. One of the other things we talk a lot about is you don't have to pit, hit every pitch. If this is a company that doesn't sound inviting to you, it's too complicated, go to the next one, right? You don't have to figure out this one if it's just crazy. On the other hand, if it's a real business and it's not a fraud, companies that are super complex, many investors throw up their hands, there will be much more opportunity for you to get it right. So where opacity exists, that's the place opportunity exists. And this is a kind of a thing we, we weigh, right? If it's real easy to know and understand, it's probably priced right. It's real hard to figure out. It's probably not priced right, which means you your opinion can actually make you something. When we ask this question of what could we have known and when, when did the fraud start? What are signs I could see? Because all these books are in arrears and they're giving you the, the dirty linens. But at the time, we didn't know all the stuff about Theranos. This is a true story. I saw the Theranos pitch in 2008. And we don't do biotech, so it was an easy thing. I chucked it. But I threw it to my partner, and I said, you know, one of the things that just struck me as odd is the board. The board had great guys, I'm sure. Henry Kissinger seems like a good guy, and George Schultz, and uh, Admiral Mattis, and all that stuff. Nobody with a biotech degree. Nobody with any sense of biotechnical science. You look at the Pfizer board, half the board has some kind of higher degree in science. And in retrospect, that was a real tell, right? She managed that board so that no one could look over her shoulder. I didn't put that together then, but it did strike me as odd. And I kind of point out to them that this is where you're, you learn rules of thumb and you have radar and this is kind of what moves you along. Um, the central conceit of this class then is, I ask the students to think, what are you just a bit better at than anybody else? What do you get right 51% of the time? You don't have to be good at everything. And at the end of the class, in groups of four, the students pitch stocks. So I had four today and I'll have two tomorrow. I bring in three celebrity judges, uh, three friends of mine, two were alums, who are, uh, one runs a real estate hedge fund, one is a venture lawyer, 
and one was a Wall Street analyst for 30 years. And they give feedback to the kids. I, I do not. I, I'm done. They, this is much better coming from professionals about what they liked, where they thought uh, the analysis was rich, where they thought it might be improved. And one of the things that uh, my friend Chris said today was he majored in economics and geosciences. And I said, well, which one of those two was more helpful for you in being an investor? And he said, geosciences. And I said, okay, so tell me why. I said, well, economics turns out to be about an interesting question, but geosciences is about how to assimilate enormous volumes of data. I'm starting with just huge reams of data and I'm hunting for patterns and, and things that will tell me something that I can draw a conclusion from. He's like, that's frankly what I do. I have more data than I know what to do with. I'm trying to find my signal to noise ratio. And his work in geosciences turns out to be much more helpful, which I thought was incredibly illuminating for the kids, right? Because uh, uh, our venture lawyer is an English major and the Wall Street Journal analyst began life, uh, he, his degree from Harvard is in um, comparative English literature. Right. Which, you know, turns out to be really helpful if you need to read an annual report in English, your mother tongue and how to read that. So I asked them, you know, you could be good at trends. You could be great at accounting. Your sense of pattern recognition. You have some specific industry knowledge. Last year I had a, a student who did UGG, the, um, the, the, the shoe company, the ugly shoe company. And she was TikTok fashion influencer, and, and she knew, you know, this will work, this will not, that's trending, that's not, in a way that nobody else really did, she called it, right? So that could be your thing. You could just understand arbitrage. You could be really good at just doing relative. You don't really know what absolute values are. Any of these are valuable. What are, what are you good at? And go with what you're good at. So, that's really the end of, of what I have. That's, um, that's how I teach. I do this in uh, 11 class sessions. We meet for two hours, three times a week. We read a fraud once a week. We do uh, lots and lots of reading. I am known for an enormous amount of reading at the beginning. And in the second two weeks, the students are on their own. They do presentations. They are preparing They pre and they present to us twice in the third week, kind of in little bits, we're getting them used to what a presentation looks like. They have five minutes to do a little piece of it. Uh, and then this week they have a half an hour and they, they present and they get feedback. And at the end of class, we will vote. So there is a real fund, an alum donated $100,000 that, that we manage. And um, at the end of class, the students will vote on what they wanna buy or sell or nothing or whatever. And that will go to a, a group called WIG, the Williams Investment Group. And all the students who've been through my class are all invited to join WIG if they want. And that group will spend the next year managing this $100,000 and investing and selling and buying and seeing what happens. And uh, it, it's fantastic. I've, I've now got four new students. They change in the calendar year because they change at winter study. And there are a few dozen kids in there and they are managing a real fund and it's teaching them a host of things about, you know, as what Justin said to me, well, this was a lot more fun when the market was just going up. Yes, Justin, I assume that that is true. Uh, and so they have bought things that have plummeted. They've bought things that have skyrocketed. They are really learning a lot by hands-on. What do they do with the money they make? It's a good question. They donate their winnings to the college and they get to pick what they want to donate. In fact, they're allowed to donate to anything in Williamstown which benefits the college. So donating to the local food pantry, college is great with that, the local elementary school, whatever it is. And we've made something, so they have done that. Um, so I oversee the fund. I, I'm sort of like the parent when you go um, bowling with your kids and you put up the guardrail so nobody throws a gutter ball. That's what I'm here for. Other than that, and, and by that I mean, we don't have sin stocks. We don't have, there's some things we can't own. But after that, they can buy things that I would think are not bright, but that's not my remit. Um, and so we, we, they meet every Monday and I, I sort of, I meet with them on Zoom and we talk about what I just there to help. I provide research reports if I can. I kind of, I'm just sort of the adult in the room. 
Um, and then it all rolls around next year. So I have had more than, uh, well, I had almost 100 students go through my class. Um, as I say, it's very popular. Winter study here is full of the most amazing classes that I have gotten to sit in on. And if anyone is interested in doing one of these, I'm happy to talk to you about the process. You can teach almost anything you want. My only advice is teach something you love. I really love teaching this. I have the time of my life and I love teaching fraud. And I think we're having a good time, but uh, you could, if anybody knows some of the students, you can ask them yourself. I think I'm, I'm pretty much on time because it's 342 and Layla's probably gonna help me with questions because I think there might be some and I'm not quite sure how to access them, but I'm gonna do my best. Thank you so much, David. I The quote of the day, I love fraud. I love that. <laughs> Thank you for a really riveting pre presentation. Um, we do have a number of questions in the queue here. Um, actually, David is uh, David Kane is asking, how many students applied for this year's course and, and what's the selection process like? So uh, I teach between, I, I have tried to home in on the right number and I, I 24 is like my happy place. Um, 20 was my happy place, but I got shoved into 24 because I, I, I've learned that teams of four are the right size. Teams of five didn't work well. So the delimiter becomes teams of four. I can have six pitches in my final two days to give them enough time. I have 24. I had 61 kids apply. I have always been oversubscribed at least double. And that is really, uh, you know, that, Hey, that feels great to me. But I don't think it's a good outcome. I mean, I, I am trying to figure out a way to get 48 kids next year so that, because I feel like if that's what you want, then we should respond to demand. How do they get in? Um, if you applied before and you didn't get in, you moved to the top of the list. I, I asked them to write a 50 word statement on why do you want to take this class and how much about finance do you know? Because I'm, I'm more targeted to kids who know less, not exclusively, but if you grew up in a family where your mom worked for a city group for 20 years, that's different than, you know, I have some students who grew up in a family restaurant, right? They know, they know zilch. So I'm here to get you off the ground. And so I, I do that. And I'm very careful to try and choose uh, an equal number of men and women. Uh, it's really important for me to provide um, role models and guest speakers and to show them that, you know, they are going to be what banking will look like. And so I want them all to have, I want them all to have that shot as an interesting experiment, which they do not know. I mix the teams up so that some are all men and some are all women and some are half and some, and then at the end we ask, did anyone notice dynamics in groups where there were different numbers of men and women? And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but when they do, it's really interesting. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, a few more questions about the course itself, and then some people have questions um, about the subject matter. So Karen's asking, could you give us an example of one of the best presentations the students have done for you in the past? Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I, they're doing them today. And so I we've been through four of them today. Um, there are pieces of each one that you know, you watch light bulbs go off. Um, today we did, um, one of the groups did Celsius. I've never had Celsius. I, I, I mean, it felt like a, you know, curmudgeon, but Celsius is, um, it's basically an energy drink, but it's marketed as a health thing, right? So it's got lots of other additives in it. And the kids love it. I mean, I, you, it's unbelievable. And their question was, it's priced so high, right? It's just an incredibly expensive stock. You have to believe so much growth. Like, do you really believe it's going to be there? And, and I, you know, they figured out that what they needed to do was go look at Monster. When Monster was this size, what happened to Monster? Is it possible to grow in a way that they want? Do we have models for that? This whole learning of how do we learn from history? How do we think about models? Where do they model correctly for us? And where do we have to make adjustments? And they went and looked at Monster and they, they convinced themselves that this was Monster Plus. And so, they became very comfortable with the price given what they think growth is going to be um, from the point because they looked at Monster when it was a billion and you know they were a billion and that was actually quite quite brilliant today. Um, I have another group that 
did a lovely job of unitizing. We talk a lot about unitizing. We want to understand the economics of any business in terms of what, what's the driving thing. So for example, in, in Celsius, is it number of cans? And is my goal to sell more cans or am I making more per can? What, what is my driver here? And this is just fun with fractions. This is like seventh grade algebra. Um, so I, I, we're going to have presentations tomorrow on Miller Knoll. I don't know anything about office furniture, but I'm going to learn a lot. And we're going to have oh, Live Nation tomorrow, which has been really fascinating because that is a, how do I think about COVID? H how do I unpack COVID from what happened? And frankly, in Live Nation, it's, I doubt that Taylor Swift is going to do another billion dollar tour next year. How does that impact the number that I'm staring at when I have this kind of crazy event year of this, this in effect bubble? Um, but the kids are really, they're very thoughtful. I mean, they, they, they really do think a lot of, one group came in today with a short, Vail Resorts. They don't like it. Uh, they're, they don't like climate change. The pricing's too high. I mean, fine. You know, that was, that was great. So th these are all examples of the kinds of stocks that they pick and then, and then pitch. Amazing. Um, we have a couple of questions about the, the use of AI and, um, the use of AI in helping choose and monitor investments and also as a tool that can be used for fraud. Do you discuss that? Um, and are financial reports required to be presented in a common format for ease of analysis? Yeah, so these are this is a great question. Um, one of my students is now going to Dimensional Fund Advisors. DFA is among the largest uh, fund management firms in the world. And it's basically an AI deal. They are all indexes with a twist. And the way that you figure it out, what twist you want, is you apply what well, you used to apply brute strength analytics, right? You, you, you just need a big computer with a big chip so that you can run millions of calculations. But lately, if you ask AI to, what AI is really good at is sensing patterns that humans can't see. Um, and so you're asking it to look for patterns and sometimes it comes up with good ones. Sometimes it comes up with nonsensical ones, right? Sometimes there isn't, you know, but it's really good at it. What's really bad, humans are bad. We, we project patterns onto things and AI doesn't. It will actually define if it's really there. And we define if it's really there in statistical terms. It, we use confidence intervals. We use measures of mean and standard deviation to tell the computer, if you find something that correlates with something else, and it correlates beyond this level of, of confidence that we define as a pattern. Humans are terrible at finding those kinds of patterns, especially in enormous data sets. So that's a firm that uses AI sort of routinely to produce better outcomes, but everybody has access to the same AI. So it's actually in the design of the looking and they are really good at the design of the looking. So, you know, it's not quite not, it's not, it's not quite Skynet went self-aware, right? You, you still have to kind of monitor. Um, one of the other things we talk about is uh, Benford's Law, and this is a fascinating little piece of, of, we use AI for it now, but Benford's Law is this wonderful example, and I, I'm going to say something three times because it's a complicated idea. We have a notion of randoms, right? There is an entire class here, which is probability. It's 301. It's a fantastic class. Mihai Stoichu is the nicest and finest professor the college has taught at the class. Awesome. Um, the whole class is designed around to ask you the question, what is randomness? What does it mean to be random? Because random does not have to mean uniform. So Benford's Law says it's a first digit question. In any random series of numbers produced by anything you want, the first digit is not random. The number one appears nine times more than the number nine. One appears more than two, appears more than three, appears more than four, appears more than five. Five and six, I think, switch. There's a little anomaly going on there, which is interesting. And then seven, eight, nine, right? So the curve of incidence of ones 
incidence of twos goes like this. Think about it like sometimes it makes sense. Well, it's more likely to have a bunch of ones begin the social security numbers than it is a bunch of nines. Because it's a nine digit number, you're gonna start filling the bucket from one. Addresses, nobody starts addressing at 8,043. You start at 101 and you go to the college's, the, 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 the course offering is 101. It doesn't start at 903. Ones appear more often, but it's still random. It's still not a thing. So it turns out this is really fascinating. Why is this fascinating? It's fascinating because when humans do fraud, they choose random and uniform. They choose twos as often as they choose eights when they fake the numbers. But we know that ones appear more than nines. So now you can ask a computer with that sense of AI and Benford's law to look for fraud because you should see this, this pattern, which is random, but not uniform, but a human will make it random and uniform. And this started in the 70s when we started noticing it, but now AI scours. The SEC uses Benford's law to scour for fraud because that, that's the way the numbers appear. So people are getting smarter and they're using Benford's law to create their numbers if you're really sophisticated. So it's a little bit of cat and mouse, but that's an example of like the beauty and elegance of something mathematical that gives you an answer that is not intuitive that we use AI to help us solve for how are we reading that that could or couldn't be, right? So these are, uh, by the way, there's another great trick that we learned uh, how to detect fraud. There's nothing to do with AI. Um, in almost every fraud we read, one of the first things that managements do is they go buy a plane. And so anytime we see people going out and buying like a G5 or a 650 or yeah, we are suspicious. We, we know this to be a bad thing. So, you know, we, we joke between there's this level of analysis and, using AI and trying to find patterns. And there are some things that are just staring you in the face, like the fleet of airplanes that Enron bought, you know, indefensible. So, you know, we want both of our brain, halves of our brain to kind of think about both of those. That's so interesting. Um, so David, we have, um... We have two questions, we can maybe combine them. So one person's asking, how, how does one get access to the books or balance sheets of a random company or business? And what advice would you have for someone interested in investing um, and finance? But maybe they're, this is completely foreign to them, completely new, they have more of a humanities background. Yeah, so um, uh, I, I um, okay, so I got the second question. Uh, oh, the first question. Yeah, so it turns out if you are publicly registered, you must present your books according to GAAP. You must present them according to the uh, Financial Accounting Standards Board's rules. Everybody has to do the same thing, mostly. there. This is an area of gray. One of the things that students are really good at is black and white. They're, they're, they're less comfortable with ambiguity. And accounting is about choices. The building's going to last 30 years. The building might last 20 years. I, I have to make decisions inside of my, my returns are gonna be what? How much loss am I gonna have? What do I provision in advance? There's lots of, for all the rules, you still have to know how to read the thing. It's sort of like reading any book in translation. I'm sure many of you can speak a foreign language and you have watched uh, a movie with subtitles and you're like, yeah, that was close. It wasn't exactly how I would have said it, but it was close. Or what you notice is the person said a very long sentence. They can't put a very long sentence in the subtitle. So they're getting it as close as they can in nine words. So we have restrictions. And so I, we talk about how all this is publicly available. You can go to the SEC site. It's called Edgar. It's beautiful. You can search it. You can search for keywords. I mean, it, it's, it's easy, but it's but that doesn't tell you how to do it. And so the second question was, well, how do we do it? I assign um, Bodie Cannon Miller, I assign a, a basic financial finance textbook, right? And it's it's got sections that are dense and it's got sections that are not dense. And then I assign another couple of brilliant books. One book is called uh, Warren Buffett Accounting, which is like a third grade reader. 
how to read the, the balance sheet, the income statement. It kind of talks to you as if you are literally probably an eighth grader. So that's a really great book. Um, we have uh, the, 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 the Little Book of Behavioral Investing by James Montier, which talks about uh, you can read all these things, but remember, you are your own worst enemy, right? You, the investor, are the disaster. I, I took this class from um, the behavioral investing class at Stanford, and the funniest thing, you know, is, you know, Kahneman won the Nobel Prizes. His first thing he says to you when he gets on, that's big thing. And he, go, and he says, okay, well, I want you to know the first thing in this class is you all are the problem. All of you, you are the problem. And what he's, what he's saying is, you're not rational. You have biases. You bring in all kinds of stuff with you. You're not a clean slate. So that's a great book that we read that kind of ties in the behavioral finance. And the thing about behavioral finance is you are your own worst enemy. But if we didn't have behavioral finance, if we were all rational, every stock would be priced efficiently. And we know that everything isn't priced efficiently. And the reason is because we're not rational. So we talk a lot about the, the from the textbooks. We have a textbook that's a Bodie Kane and Miller. It's a, it's a, they're on it. I don't know, edition 15. We read the 13th one because I'm cheap and I have them buy an older copy because there's not anything new under the sun and it's cheaper. Um, I have them read this Warren Buffett book and I have them read a fantastic book, which I will put in a plug for, um, which is called Financial Shenanigans. And it's by Howard Schillett. And you can get it on Amazon, you can Kindle it. Uh, and it is, he's a forensic accountant and he was, went and cleaned up Enron basically. And he's got 200 pages of all the tricks, all the ways it happens. And he's got example after example after example. So it's not dry and, and, you know, sort of, oh, you could do this in the accounting. It's like, yeah, you could do this. And here's somebody who did it. And here's what they did. Here's the jail cell they're in now. And this is how long it lasted. And it's absolutely a brilliant book. So I have the kids read both books that are technical, books that explain it in English, books that explain um, uh, behavioral in English, and books that talk about fraud. And it turns out after today I get my feedback Howard Schillett's their favorite book because it it's the concrete example of all the things they have been learning and now they get to see just example after example after example it's a little dated most of the examples are from 15 20 years ago because Howard's kind of semi-retired um but I that's great and I'm happy Layla if, if if you want I'm happy to share my syllabus um you know with you if that's something that that people want access to um yeah, I mean, it's a one pager. It tells you what chapters we read, what books we read, all my reading list and my um, uh, supplement. And the last book I would put in a plug for is a book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which is Kahneman's book about how we make these rational decisions and how we can, we can't guard against them, but we can be aware of the kinds of choices that we're making. So there's, there you go. That's terrific. Thank you so much, David. We do have people in the chat saying they would love the syllabus. So we will send that out in a post event Great. email. Um, we have somehow reached the end of our time. I feel like that hour flew by. It was so interesting. And I know I learned a lot and our alums in the audience did as well. Um, but a big round of applause for, for David here from the Purple Valley. Um, and we will be in touch with more resources so you can continue your learning. Uh, and I know there were a number of questions we just didn't have time to get to in the Q&A. We've copied them and we will share them with David and um, hopefully can get some of those um, questions answered. But thank you so much. And uh, until next time, until next alumni winter study. Take care.